Hello, adventurers, and welcome to yet another installment in my Legend of Kalamantura series. Um, in this episode, um, I'm going to talk about the Salazan dynasty. Uh, they were one of the parties. I'm not going to call them the aggressor because the, the outcome of the, the war I've talked about previously. The war ended amicably enough. Um, I'm settled by negotiators and diplomats around a table, type a round table discussion. Um, and it's still debated to this day among certain people in both uh, the council and the dynasty as to who the aggressor was. Again, it really depends what side of which, where you're from and what side of history you sit on. Um, again, there's no victor, there's no loser, so it just really depends where you're from. And who fills your pockets. So, the dynasty is a landmass similar in size to the council. In fact, I would say it's a larger landmass. Um, it's sort of located in my head again. I don't have a world map yet. Um, I'm going to work on Hopefully get one done in the next few weeks. So, uh, one of my new players, Titus. Um, he very kindly... I had a map of Mentura that I, a little pen and paper thing that I had drawn, tucked away in the folder, I'm going to pull it out now. But he did have a pen and paper. I had a pen and paper map, which he very kindly took, colorized, put some detail as me and him a bit of discussion about the various settlements that I had drawn out. So we now have a colored map uh, for the party. Uh, so we'll get a world map and a map of the, the dynasty done soon. But the dynasty, as I was saying, was a much larger physical landmass um, to the east and south of the council. It's kind of, eh, it might have sort of towards the southeast. It's a much more, it's a more hotter and arid climate. Um, if you get further south, you do sort of come towards what I would call the south pole of the planet. So towards the south, you do get colder, obviously, but for the most part, the Pangaea, the count, the the continent that the dynasty occupies, is very quite dry and quite arid, and mostly inhospitable, um, except for the most adaptable, most fierce of creatures. So travel in the dynasty is difficult. There are established routes and roads that you follow that are actually protected and this is all me just coming up with this right now um but there are established roads and routes that you travel across and that are protected by the military the uh, the areas around them are police to try and prevent the create the natural creatures that live there from attacking there are very few settlements uh within the dynasty um there's a couple many there's a couple of coastal areas um Again, I don't have a map, but I imagine around the coast you have quite a few. Um, there's one that we've already mentioned in our previous sessions called um, Tequila Bear. T-E-K-U-I-L-A Bear. Uh, that's where the merchant Thrum is from. So that's where he's from. Uh, I don't know where that's going to be just yet, but one of the areas is called Tequila Bear. And the dynasty, <coughs> I imagine, as a collection of city-states kind of like ancient Greece. Um, although not unlike Greece, each city-state is... The city-states are unified. There is no collection of Greek kings or leaders that want to fight and vie for power. Hello. Uh, but at the moment, the city-states are unified, and they're unified by the reigning monarch, Empress Ne Salazan. Now, you remember I talked about that in the war video. She was, at the end of the war, that she was captured by a party from the council and she was the bargaining chip that the council held and the, and the dynasty held Terran. It, they didn't actually take it, but the city had been bombarded that much and starved over the entire course of the war that it was ready to fall. So each side held that, well, we have your we have your ruler, well, we have your military capital, this is where your military strength comes from, this falls, the military will crumble. See you with the Empress. She is a dwarven woman. She's, at this point in her life, she's certainly a lot older. 
I imagine her to be in her two to three hundreds, maybe towards the three hundred years old. So dwarves live to around four hundred years old. That's my understanding. I might have misread that, but in my head, she's an older dwarf, and she's starting to show this the the, the signs of that the war took its toll on her. The the stress of being the monarch, the sole decision maker. Uh, yes, you will have uh, you will have your advisors, obviously, but she was the one running the country. So the stress of that the war took its toll on her and aged her a bit. So to meet her, she looks sort of like slightly past middle age. You know, when like I'm twenty eight, I'm a young man. Um, but when you get to sort of people in their fifties and sixties, this start to look. <laughs> if I offend anyone who's older, I apologize. But you just, there's certain people you look at them and go, yeah, you're definitely not like a senior 70s and 80s. There's people in their sort of their 60s, 50s of their, their, their twilight of their life entering the autumn. You know, the hair is starting to grey, the skin starts to sag and wrinkle. You can just see each. That's what the Empress is like at this point. But she commands massive respect within the dynasty because she unified all the city states. Uh. <clears throat> she rules from a fortress city known as Torok. Now, Torok is quite central. Um, from the outside, from the surface, it looks just like a collection of rocks. It's very unassuming from the outside. But the important part, Torok was settled because, well, it's it looks like an unassuming bunch of rocks. But once you get into it, it's all a massive network of sort of under of, of caverns and tunnels. Um, it's not dwarven. The Empress is dwarven, but it's not. It's not. We're not talking about. Not quite Uthodurn from Critical Role, slightly like that, but not quite as underground. Uh, it just happened that this massive rock formation is relatively hollow, so the fortress city is built into this. Um, and it's natural rock formation, there are very few points for a large force to approach it from. And even then, those those points are massively protected. And the city itself, uh, there are several underground rivers deep beneath the surface um, that made this a, a, a pretty much a perfect settlement because you have the underground rivers. So you have deep underground, you have a water source and you're able to have a water source, and you're able to set up farms down there, or you're able to bring the water up to the surface and have farming land. So she, the Bempress, has led for around 200 years, and over the period of the first 70 years or so of her reign, um, well, sorry, no. She rose to power. She was the head of the city-state of Tarok. Tarok ruled a certain chunk of it. Arguably the most powerful city state, and the Salazan family, uh, the dynasty, if you will, uh, had long wanted to unify the city states. It's always been talked about in Pangaea historically was that the city states wanted to unify, and there were a couple of times in the past they had unified when there had been wars with the council or the republic. So there have been historical accounts where they've unified, but then they go about the separate ways again. The Empress is the first person to see to actually unify and solidify and effectively create the United. It's kind of like the United States. You had the 13 colonies of the territories, and then she unified them. So that's what she's famed for, and that's what she did. It took her about 70 years to do so. Uh, it was a combination of diplomacy, negotiations... And for some of them, war. Just going, okay, my city declares war on you because we will conquer you and bring you into the fold. She was... She's very... She's dwarven, so she is stubborn. She's a very even-tempered woman, but once she puts her mind on something, that is it. It is... It's like she will move mountains with her willpower and her army of loyal subjects. That's how it works. And... As I mentioned previously, um, kind of the antithesis of Mentura. Mentura, the council, is a very religious society. 
Um, they worship the pure ones very heavily. It's steeped in their culture, it's their history. The dynasty doesn't. Um, they are an atheistic society. They don't worship the pure ones. They don't worship the gods. There are some who do. Um, but many who don't. And as a result of that, uh, there's a bit of info dumping, maybe some... Well, it's kind of was alluded to in my war video. Because the pure ones were not worshipped in the dynasty, there is no magic there. So everything that's done in the dynasty was done by, by man, if you will. It was done by the people who lived there. The cities were built by hand. There was no magic to help. So to keep up with societies that have magic and have access to that sort of power... The dynasty is a technologically advanced civilization. Now, I don't mean we have Mentura is a medieval setting with swords and bows, and the dynasty is as fucking starships. It's not like that. What they do have is there. Excuse me. Hmm. They were the first power to discover and harness black powder, so they have black powder-based firearms. Um, recent, in recent history that has turned into cartridges so we now have, if you know your firearms history, you have, start off with like muzzle loading muskets, flintlock pistols at this point in time we have the dawn and they're not all, they're not, not everywhere, certain military units do have them and even in the dynasty, and some elsewhere have them, but very few we do now have cartridge based firearms Still black powder, but that's where the dynasty is at in terms of their weaponry. That's what made them special. And also, the I mentioned the underground rivers in Turok. Turok being one of the more powerful city-states. Uh, again, you talk about the value intelligence and the human mind and the human desire. I talk about human, but we understand what we're talking about here. The desire to overcome nature and survive and to thrive. Some very clever individuals have figured out hydroelectricity. They've figured out how to get power out of water. So underneath Tarok there are hydroelectric dams, if you will. They're crude. They're not like a modern techno hydro hydroelectrical dam. But they do have access to electricity. Now that does not mean... All of the dynasty is powered. <laughs> Not even all of the Turok is powered. The power is there. And it powers some of the defences. And it powers like the palace and the inner city. Um, there are projects in place to try to expand that. But they have electricity in some areas. They have technologically advanced weapons. They have steam power. In some, so they have some steam powered vessels, they have some steam powered transport. They need technology to make their life easy, so they're technologically advanced uh, civilization. Um, and as things stand, there is experimentation with flammable gases and liquids as a fuel source. So we're seeing the beginning of that. Historically, I would put that kind of in around the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, maybe slightly further back than that, maybe more the 18th, the 19th century. So that's kind of where they're at technologically. Um, because they need to be. And they also have the beginnings of, with magic, you have sending stones and the sending spell. That's how you communicate across vast distances. Um... That's not an option in the dynasty, um, although some individuals have discovered cable communication. So we have the beginnings of telegrams and the telephone. We have the beginnings of that. It's only over short distances. Uh, so at the moment, like the, the palace in Tarok and the capital cities have like an intercom system and a communication system from the palace to the outer defences. That's what it's used for at the moment. It's, oh, we found this. They, this is useful for the military. It's used for the military. That's kind of what drives them. And speaking of the military, 
we have two major groups within the dynasty. We have the Blades, who make up about 60% of the armed forces, and the Powders, who have the other 40. Uh, the Blades are a mix of infantry and cavalry, around 70 infantry to 30% cavalry. Uh, light infantry units with shields and war picks. Fewer heavy infantry with full plate and halberds because the arid climate makes heavy armor difficult to wear for extended periods of time. So they primarily use lighter armors and lighter weapons um, and have lighter cavalry units. I imagine the lighter... Oh, what are they called? Oh, there's a historical cavalry unit. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's going to annoy me. Oh no, what were they called? Not the Hazars. Cataphracts, that's the ones. Uh, the Cataphracts, that's my, that would be the heavy cavalry. Uh, like heavy cavalry with lances and war hammers. They're a powerhouse of a cavalry unit. Again, not very many of them, but they do have them. And the light cavalry use short bows, javelins, and some now do have firearms. They're kind of like the Mongol archers from the uh, Attila the Hun. Kind of based on that to an extent. And then the other more modern part of the infantry are the powders. They're 40% or so, so they're slowly overtaking uh, the bulk of the army. And you do have rifle units. Um, again, think of uh, American War of Independence and maybe earlier than that tactics are being used uh, you have volley fire rifle units you do have some specialized sniper I'm going to use the term incorrectly but it gives you an idea you have marksman units who have better designed rifles who are able to pick out key targets so they're not called snipers Sniping, that's a, that's a modern term. It's a very modern term, sniper. The British marks, but historically... Please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. But that's where the dynasty's at. So we have these marksman units and individual marksmen or women who are very, very highly skilled and have some very well-crafted uh, weaponry. There's a few, there are very, the manufacturing process is known globally now, but there's very few weaponsmiths who are able to make rifles of such high quality and caliber, if you will, boom tish, <laughs> such high caliber rifles uh, that are useful for like sniping. There are maybe one or two scattered about the party might encounter, who knows? Um, we shall see how far... They, we'll see where they end up. There may be someone like that overseas. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so... Along with the invention of black powder, we not only have small arms, rifles, pistols, revolvers, we also have field artillery is a thing in the dynasty. Now, I'm not talking... I'm not talking railway guns. Uh, more like pack howitzers, small... Project small cannons. Um, again, because they don't, don't have magic, they rely on technology. So we do have cannons that are portable in the field. Uh, they're devastating. They're very... The soldiers trade with these very heavily, so they're very skilled. Um, I would say they're... I would say they're kind of like British cavalry... British cannonry. Like British naval cannonry. That's a word was exceptional. They had longer guns, they had better guns, uh, and, and like the Napoleonic brass cannons. This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. They have these very powerful field cannons that can be moved around the battlefield and use great effect. They're also used for the defense of the city. Now, not everything is black powder. It's still a fairly new technology. They're still refining it, so it's there. For, for Laura, it's been pistols and revolvers was fine. Cannons are newer technology. Um, and they're starting to phase out um, torsion-based ballista and catapults and the like. Well, they still have them, but they're switching over to more 
black powder based technology. Sorry, my computer keeps walking on this screen. Um, and we do have some mortars. They're not man portable mortars. Not even they're not man portable, uh, as we would know them. Think more about again U.S. Civil War. Uh, mortars. Do us a favor. Pause the video. Go look up U.S. Civil War mortars, and artillery. That's kind of the vibe I get for the Salazar Dynasty, and they are vicious. And then we also have the Salazan Navy. Again, they're mostly, most of the dynasty, they do have a lot of coastal settlements and they're very few inland. Uh, Tarok is the exception, but then again, it's fed by water. Uh, it's a freshwater underground rivers. But they don't have very many inland stuff. They're mostly a coastal nation. And because of that, there's a history of there's a history of sailing among them. So their navy um, is to have a navy. It's small in comparison to the dynasty or the republic, but it's vicious. It's a small, very highly trained navy, and because they're technologically based, they have they do have wind. They still have sail. Still use sailing ships, but they have some like they have like some sort of steam. Turbine propeller power based uh, warships that are armor plated and have cannons on board. Again, like I said, kind of like the British naval, the British navy ships, and even some of the American warships. I'm not saying they have anything like what was used in the American Civil War. These massive armor plated Goliaths. They don't, well, they might do. They might have one of those. They're still very much wood and steel, but they have steam power and cannons, which outrange anything that another navy might have. So they have a smaller navy, but it's much more vicious. They can engage from further away, and their gunners are excellent. Again, British Navy. Excuse me, the British Royal Navy uh, from the Napoleonic era and like the age of steel and black powder. That's my interpretation of the dynasty. So... I hope people find that interesting. I hope my party, if they watch this, also find that interesting. Um, gives them a bit of background knowledge into the dynasty. I would say most of the party would know that. Again, Lorilla, you don't know this. You might know bits of it, but your hermit background is kind of making you not really know this. You're learning, but it's not many of the party would... Some of you are aware of this. Titus, you're very aware of this. With your background, you would know this. Um... Well, you know most of it. You don't necessarily understand all of it, but yeah, it'll come up in the as it, as we go along anyway. But again, I hope people find that interesting. And yeah, that's my talk about the dynasty done for the day. Uh, next up, I really need to get the the Republic of Alberino finished up, but that'll be a future video. But yeah, thanks for coming, adventures. Um, thanks for sticking with me, and until next time.